Good afternoon, everyone. So, unleashing the potential of gaming market in India. Um, exciting topic. I think we've heard a lot about it from morning. We've heard some great numbers. Uh, all the positive upbeat. Uh, so, just beginning the uh, session, uh, uh, we've been seeing some staggering numbers, right, uh, from morning. Uh, essentially, we're looking at what, 750 million internet base. We're looking at 500 million gamers, that's as big as EU and uh, uh, the US market put together, right, in terms of gamers. Essentially, 90, 85 to 90 percent of them being mobile gamers and we are on the cusp of a 5G revolution. So, a lot of staggering numbers there. Uh, in fact, we've also uh, uh, spoken about the potential of the market in itself, right? I, uh, there's, there's, there's quotes everywhere in terms of the potential of the gaming industry becoming as big as movies and sports put together. Uh, it's already happened globally and I think uh, uh, we're looking at, uh, we are hoping to look, uh, look at a similar numbers uh, coming about in India as well. Uh, that brings about a buzzing ecosystem along with it, right? And we have some of the key players from the ecosystem uh, along with us today and we'll touch upon some uh, very interesting aspects as we go along in this session. And uh, all I can say is the potential is mouth-watering. Uh, uh, we'll be, we'll be, the report we just released in the morning uh, says that we're looking at a number of almost uh, uh, 11, uh, sorry, 8.6 billion in terms of revenue by 2025, and that's that's a lot. And that essentially also translates to a uh, economic potential of around 800 uh, uh, billion over a period of five years. So that's a sizable number for everyone to look into. So. Having said that, I'll uh, I hand over uh, 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 the topic, uh, so I hand over uh, 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 to the panelists to introduce themselves. Uh, Jaya, over to you. Hi. Hey, everyone. I'm so glad to be here. Uh, I'm Jaya Chahar. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Trade Fantasy Game, TFG. It's a fantasy gaming app um, and it's played with six-player uh, format and uh, the use of digital collectibles. Yeah, hi everyone, good to be here. Uh, I'm Utsav, the co-founder and the CBO at Esports Exo. So Esports Exo is a marketplace for end-to-end, -end, anything you have to do with uh, the esports and gaming, from creating the IP to managing the tournament end-to-end. -end. Hello, hi everyone, my name is Shrikan. I'm the CEO and co-founder of the company Ad Scholars. Um, we are not in the gaming, but we actually make money for the gamers. Uh, so by connecting publishers with the brands, and we take care of the ads that run on the gamers. That's what we do. I'd like to talk to you after the panel is over. I want to make some money. Uh, so I'm Harish. I'm a founder, game director, and writer at Outlier Games. So uh, my studio specifically focuses on making uh, single-player story-driven games for PC and console. So that's the kind of game company that I'm building today. So I see a lot of esports people here, a lot of gamers. So you may be thinking of some company when, when I say story-driven games, right? So probably in the future, that's where I want to take Outlier Games. So story, wherein, when I, the moment I say single-player story-driven games, you think of Outlier Games. So that's, that's the kind of company that I'm making. So over to you. Hi, my name is Nilesh Kulkani. I don't belong to e-gaming, but I am into sports education where I create manpower which gets supplied to all the gamers who are doing wonderful job in the industry. So I'm the creator of creating manpower who will effectively deliver what is expected in India and overseas. Anurag and Hi guys, my name is Anurag. I'm a founder of a company called Newgen Gaming where we have uh, two brands. One is called Penta Esports, which is basically a esports tournament operator. But we focus on the grassroots uh, leagues, which is MHA League and Colgate League. And another other brand we have started is called Panda Production, which is creating, telling beautiful stories with gaming as a backdrop. So that's us. Hi guys, my name is Ninad Chaya, and I'm the senior VP at Reliance Games. Uh, I think probably the only, uh, the oldest gaming company in India, and we make games which are played by more than half a billion gamers across the world, right from IP-based games like Real Seal and WWE Mayhem to casual games based on kids' IP like Little Singham. So it's, it's, it's a fun space to be in and good to see a, a good variety of speakers today to share our views. 
Great, thank you everyone. Uh, let's begin with the, the topic in terms of here and now, uh, in terms of the emerging trends we are seeing uh, as of now uh, and how is it impacting the uh, industry in itself. I think, let me begin with a point which we spoke about in the morning in the report, right? We spoke about 2.5% uh, of RMG spends, uh, uh, a part of ADEX, right? And I'd, I'd like to bring in Jaya here to talk about some of the important trends you are uh, uh, foreseeing or you are already seeing in terms of uh, the market potential here. See, in terms of the market potential and specifically in RMG space, firstly I'd say that the entire online gaming is in India currently being driven by the mobile gaming phenomenon completely, right? If you completely see the gaming aspect in India, while you know I'm sure we have different thought processes on the panel itself, but RMG today is the largest user base, as you rightly mentioned. With 5G coming in, that will be uh, quadrupling, you know, in, in the next couple of years. And so to speak, uh, another 500 million handsets are going to be coming in, right, in tier 2, tier 3, tier 4 cities. What does that really mean for us and the emerging trends that we see today is a lot of people, uh, not, not that in RMG uh, only the cash rewards, we've, we've typically known that cash rewards is what is driving people to play more on RMG, right? It can be different platforms. But today we also see that a lot of uh, gamification is happening on th that front. That's where we have also come in, right? Uh, there is a need for gamification, uh, there is a need to bring in, uh, you know, different kind of gaming in RMG and also give a better experience to the user base that's already there, right? Apart from that, what I've also seen and we've been, you know, kind of speaking about it with different industry leaders as well, the, uh, sp the women in sports that are coming up, right? Uh, if you see the first time ever we've got women's Indian Premier League that happened this year, right? Uh, not only have women come in in sports, but there are more women gamers that have come in, right? There are women gamers in fantasy sports today uh, who are almost at 30% of the user base and there are women gamers even across other online games. So I think those are one of the, uh, you know, th that is one of the emerging trends that I see in today's time. On that note, I think I'd, I'd bring in another player uh, uh, which is essentially the large player uh, or a large stakeholder which is eSports and Utsav, I'd, I'd like to bring you into the conversation here in terms of how do you see eSports taking advantage of a lot of trends which are coming in here, right? As tournaments, as teams, as IPs, how do you see that uh, coming through? Uh, see, as uh, Jaya said, ki, uh, RMG is the highest spender that, that, that we are seeing right now. I think uh, we, can, we, have, we should also see that uh, from the other point of view is ki, uh, we have to we have to also see ki that there's a large amount of audience, those who are introduced to R R R RMG, okay? But the now eSports coming into the picture and we are getting more popular games like BJMI, Valorant and the more games are coming in the picture, okay? I, I feel when they're introduced to uh, uh, a better game quality games and better quality in in environment for their entertainment and making money, okay? So I, I, I think it, 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 it will be more towards the eSports. And uh, now the, uh, the question that you have asked ki, uh, we feel uh, the, the players like Crafton, the Valve, the Riot that, that they're doing right now and they're supporting the third party tournaments and helping us in creating the more IPs, okay. This year also we are all, uh, almost launching uh, six plus IPs in which the three are going to be micro and the three, three is going to be the major IPs which is going to be held in more than 20 plus cities, okay. So we feel it, it, it's a great part, we are building a community right now but over a period of time we feel uh, it is going to be much bigger. Uh, we see non-endemic brands coming to the picture and now putting some budget and trying out ki how it is going to be there and how the engagement are, engagements are happening. And uh, they are seeing the better results. We are, we are trying to uh, make the uh, uh, organic branding assessments and uh, we can help them in that matter. Sure. From a uh, publisher developer uh, ecosystem or a stakeholder standpoint, Harish, how do you, how do you see this trend? Uh, benefiting the developers or uh, uh, the, the, the ecosystem in itself. Okay, so in the next uh, one, two years, right? Yes. Okay. yes, yes, yes. Okay, so in terms of that, what I would say is, uh, like in the past one, two years, what has happened to us, there were certain genres in mobile, right? Like there's something called hyper-casual games, which actually failed. Uh, in, it's pretty much dead. And then after that, it moved towards hybrid casual, which also is now pretty much gone. 
So I see a rise or a maturity curve where the game industry is being pushed more and more towards more complex or, or more deeper games, which is mid-core and hardcore. So that I've been seeing and a lot of Indian companies are now getting into that space. So I'm seeing this maturity curve wherein the market is demanding it and then the companies are forced to move towards more deeper games. So I say that's where the money pot is in the future going forward. Those kinds of mid-core and hardcore experience, it can be mobile or PC console, but that's the immediate uh, moment that I see in the market actually. Interesting, interesting. So uh, for any industry to uh, uh, flourish, uh, uh, no matter how much, uh, how much organic goodness is there, I think there is a significant push which, is need to, which needs to come from the government in itself, right? In terms of policies, in terms of uh, uh, the benefits which they are giving to the industry. Uh, I'd like to touch upon the fact in terms of what are the government policies and what are the uh, initiatives which are coming in from the government uh, to help the industry uh, grow in itself and put India into the, uh, uh, on the global map. Sure. So, uh, two financial years back, Indian government announced something called uh, AVGC Task Force, right? So, that is now coming out with something that we call AVGC XR policy. So, it's going to be thousands and thousands of crores worth of a corpus. So, from that, how many thousands is going to be given to animation, VFX, games, that's a discussion to be had. So, the industry, they have pretty much openly asked the industry that you people tell me how much money you need and where will that money go and what kind of holistic growth will it drive. So, I've been involved with that AVGC task force committee and I told them perhaps the push and the entire focus should be on original IP production. Because what that does, and the government actually, uh, the AVGC task force accepted, because in their perspective, the push towards original IP means GDP, economic growth, and also soft power growth, right? So the government looks at it from that optics. But from a consumer, sorry, more so as a producer, what it means for companies is we get to become exporters of IP, right, across the globe. So as a market, from an importer of gaming IP, we become exporters of gaming IP. So I, I suggested this to the task force committee and then they accept it. So uh, we are now in the stage where we are preparing a white paper. In fact, Anurag and Nina are also involved in that. So I got a 60, 60 plus companies together and we are making a push towards the government as to what kind of support can be given. So, and the government has pretty much, to, be, uh, to cut it short, what they have told us, give us an approach, right? If it's, if it's going to be incentivizing the development of original IP, how can we go about doing it? So we gave a five-pronged approach. What could be the startup promotion angle? What could be the regulatory angle? What could be the uh, education and upskilling angle? And uh, what could be infrastructure angle? And what could be the IEC angle? Which is the awareness campaigns that the governments do. So how can we leverage government's uh, PIB, the Press, uh, Press Information Bureau? How can we leverage that to create a culture? So these are the five-pronged approaches that we suggested and they are very receptive towards it. Why, by these five, we are hopefully looking to create an economy, I mean, the gaming market which could become a net exporter eventually. So the vision document pretty much says, how can we convert India into a net exporter of games by 2047? So that's the kind of sentiment that's going on. You touched upon two aspects here while you're talking about. One is, I'll, I'll like to bring in Anurag, but before that I'd like to bring in Nilesh here because you spoke about education and uh, uh, upskilling. And Nilesh, you've been doing a lot of work in that space. So I would, I'd like to hear your view about uh, uh, the government policies in terms of uh, uh, education and upskilling. So uh, there are two, two sides to it. Uh, the good thing is industry is not organized. And I use that as an analogy, good thing, because that creates an opportunity to stabilize it, grow it, and make it more mature for the future uh, prospects of all the business entities who are sitting here to capitalize the opportunity. So that's one way of looking at it. The second most important part is e-gaming is one sport where it's not residing into a particular country. It's, phenom it's traditionally a global sport. Even if you introduce or, in or create a new sport, it pretty much is catered to global markets, whereas majority of the countries design their sports for their respective countries, barring e-sport. So that another opportunity gets linked with how you look at the lens with which you want to introduce the sporting perspective into e-gaming, e-sports and any other areas in this digital world. The third most important part is, from a government standpoint, that creates job opportunities. 
that creates manpower employability and with this current youth which india is currently at about 55 60% and out of which almost 25 to 30% clearly wanting to focus on this particular area without having to sweat a bit uh, on the field this creates more opportunity for them to get jobs and i think that's one of the key factors where a couple of discussions which i have had with government officials undermining the opportunity for creating job you know fundamentally every government has a vision document and a mission document to create jobs with this the rapid growth of uh, this particular space trust me the growth is more than 15 to 20% for the jobs to be created in the market and that's phenomenal and staggering for on these three uh, uh, fronts i personally feel uh, the the opportunities are good the the sky is blue and the horizon is unlimited for for all of us to be in this space that's heartening to hear um as an industry veteran anurag i i'm taking the liberty to say that as an industry veteran what's your point of view because harish has uh, spoken about a lot in terms of the government policies and formulation so sorry uh, i have a very different uh, point of view when it comes to government policy the growth of uh, software industry if you see is because government was not involved and that's how our industry has grown for last 25 years i've been in this industry it is irrespective of government yes i see a lot of moves being done by the government but the implementation is going to take time so i am not l- looking for changes immediate changes but as a policy as the growth factor it might or might not even happen so i have slightly different opinion on that side uh, i think one uh segment which i think will uh, have a larger say in terms of government policies is rmg and jay i'd like to hear your point of view in terms of how do you uh, see this space you know i'm very excited to talk about this because i think it affects everybody right let me tell you 3 years back nobody even though you know in rmg space we had been told by the supreme court there was a ruling that you know fantasy uh, rummy poker everything is a game of skill right nowhere in any budget were we spoken about when the last two budgets we have been spoken about right what does that mean it means that we've at least got recognition as a legitimate sector for the government right that's good for india that's good for us as players because you're recognized anybody who's illegitimate tomorrow will not be recognized and will not get support from the country's regulations right number two that i'd like to talk about is definitely the new the new uh, regulations that we've got in terms of tds gst is still sort of pending but uh, you know the tds uh, that has that has just come in the threshold of 10000 has been removed and there's uh, 30% tds on net winnings today so if you withdraw any net winnings above 100 rupees in a month you will be charged at 30% and us as a rmg platform have to deduct that right now what does this do definitely i would say it's a higher slab we were earlier taxed at actually just 18% right um so that obviously has an impact on uh, the psyche of the user i mean as a user i will actually feel ki main khelu ya nahi khelu right kyunki 30% to mere tax mein ja raha hai right but there are good side and there are bad sides and i would say there are better good sides because the government is today recognizing you and we need to be we need the government support you know you you need it to exist in the country the ease of business uh, and the access to a lot of uh, opportunities as a business have to be given by the government interesting because this layer of the industry i think needs a larger uh, discussion topic but in the interest of time i'll move on to the next segment which is uh, the core of this entire industry right which is essentially the publishers and the developers and uh, at this point in time i'd like to bring in ninad here uh, in terms of your point of view on we're talking about putting india on the global scale right how as a, a publisher or a developer ecosystem we are geared up to uh, do that both for india and outside india so that's a very very interesting point siddharth and and for a long time across the industry there has been this discussion about should developers go self publishing or do you need a publisher to go with and, and where we bring or we have been in the in both spaces right when we started off 
we built our own games and we published them both for the India and the global market. While our games are made in India, they're meant for the global market. And as, as a team, we work, uh, so we are a very IP-focused company. I mean, we, we kind of stayed away from the whole service side uh, model and we created our own IPs and also then started working on licensed IPs. Uh, and I think one of our first breakout hits globally was the game we built on the film Real Steel. Uh, and, and, and then we kind of built out a franchise out of it. Uh, and that helped us open up to a lot of gamers around the world to understand the user behavior, uh, what works, what doesn't work for a global title. And that's now the learning that we are now bringing to our developer partners, where we say, hey, look, if there are 500 million plus gamers out there playing our games across the, the bouquet of games that we have, why not, why, how can we leverage that learning and help you guys build better games as a, as a development team? And, and we're building this ecosystem where the learning and the talent from the development partner can help us create games which, like you said, help put India on the global map. And, and it's not just us. There are quite a few other companies doing that, both in India and globally. I mean, why so, should we not have... So, so there is an E and Activision. Why not have a similar model in India? On that note, uh, is there any specific point of view in terms of a uh, local nuance or a cultural nuance coming in there for the market uh, which can then be scaled up to uh, the global market? Anything specific uh, uh, on that? Sure. I, I think at the, at the core of it, the game, the fundamental is that the game has to be fun, engaging and monetizable. Right? Irrespective of what market you go into, that doesn't change. The, the local flavor comes depending on what market you're targeting and what IP you are building on. So in India, if we are building a, a runner game, yes, there is a subway surfer, but then, and, and to put a very unsubtle plug, there's a little thing of runner also out there, which we have built. Uh, but when you are targeting the global market, a game different to that market. So in the US, for example, one of our biggest games is WWE Mayhem. And, and it's not just targeted at the US market, it's also big across the world. So like, like I said, make in India, but make for the world, it doesn't matter I mean, I may launch Little Singham as Super Cop Singham in, in other emerging markets down the line. The game has to be fun and, and monetizable. Uh, and Harish, your point of view in terms of developing an IP? Sure. So, I'll give first-hand experience because the game that I'm making is an Indian kind of a game but made for the global audience as Ninad was saying. Uh, what's happening is, uh, outside of India, especially in the Western markets, uh, the publishers, all of them are clamoring for Indian-based content. The reason is very simple. When you look at the history of gaming, you will see that there has been games based on American setting, medieval European, Greek, Norse, Japanese. They are all thinking that Indian-based content is the next jackpot to be had. And I have spoken to at least 15 publishers who all agree on this. Uh, RRR, in a very interesting way, a movie ended up in, uh, influencing game publishers. And uh, there was a game in 2020 called uh, Raji. It was an Indian game for PC and console that created a lot of interest among publishers for India-based content. So where I was coming in from was from the same angle, right? Some of the Indian movies are now going big abroad also. So yeah. is there a gameplay opportunity for us there in terms yeah, of developing? Yeah, definitely. So there is a business interest outside of India. There's also a consumer interest outside of India for Indian-based games. But what I would want to highlight here is this India-based content it is a novelty factor. It will wear off in three, five years, once the first cycle of it is over. After that, what will sustain is a good game, a good quality game. So we can't capitalize on just calling ourselves Indian-based content for the world all the time. Maybe for the first five years, it will lead an explosive growth. After that, it's pretty much a matter of quality. Sure. Um, I think that brings me to the next point, which is the revenue driver, the monetization and the revenue streams, right? Uh, multiple aspects, uh, there is in-game business revenue, there is uh, advertising, there is influencers, there is the live stream, there is the esports, the teams, the prize money and so on and so forth. So before I get into the industry in itself, I would, I'd like to bring in Nilesh here in terms of how you've seen cricket grow uh, uh, as a sport in the country, right? You've seen that first hand on ground and how do you draw parallels for that in the esports ecosystem? Well, to start with, I did not get an IPL contract. So, 
and then I retired from cricket. <laughs> But uh, on a serious note… Uh, IPL came a little late. Sorry? IPL came a little late. Possibly, yeah. I'm too old for it now. So, <laughs> But uh, the good part is, I think uh, if you break that into five-year cycle, how IPL evolved as a sport commercially and engagingly. See, the fundamentals have remained the same. The bat and the ball contest is the same. The innovation this year of IPL, we've, saw, we've, we've seen six or seven games going over 200 and out of which three games are chased. That's engaging, that's interesting. Those contests are people love watching, but from the revenue st uh, standpoint, both Star Sports and uh, uh, Digital Media, uh, Geo, have doubled their revenues. That's staggering for me. And in last, I mean, if you break that into first five years, BCCI did not have a digital media right. The next five years, they sold it for more than 3,700 crore. And today, for next five years, we've seen it 18,000 crore rights have been sold. That's the kind of jump and a potential you have in this particular space. And mind you, BCCI have not introduced cricket as an e-game as yet, or globally, ICC has not done it as yet. So that's a great opportunity to look at commercialization. But when you see that kind of a revenue, you put that into American contest. America, America have got NFL as the local sport. And I'm using word local sport because that confines to that country. That's into top three of their sporting chart, which has multiple options available for you, not only by playing, but digitally as well. And that's a model in which India can look at potentially because of the 1.5 billion population with the numbers and these people are introducing that sport in a different context. For me, that's a great opportunity because, you know, with 55% of our youth into this space, hungry for this kind of content, I see a great potential and put that analogy into a business side of the cricketing analogy to the e-gaming and the virtual reality. I think it's a phenomenal thing because I run a college and in my college, 35% of our students put their hand up the moment you start seeing there's their e-game competition. And when I get to meet the students who walk into door of ISM, sir, I am XYZ, I am YZ, I am AB as their nicknames into any of the, uh, all these guys. And I'm like, no, you are Yashesh. No, no, sir, my nickname is this. So they are recognized in a class also by nickname. That's how the popularity is growing within the fraternity also. For me, that's a very good analogy from a business to popularity as well. Uh, Shrikant, I'd like to uh, bring you in here because this is the core My business topic. in terms of… <laughs> so, what's your point of view in terms of what kind of revenue streams can open up here, right? Because there is a lot of revenue streams yeah. outside broadcasting as a space. Yes. So, I would, I would like to add it on to Nilesh. There is a very great opportunity. Uh, thanks to all these people for creating that platform uh, in the gaming industry. Uh, because we've been seeing uh, playing games for the last three decades and it has been taken out by the other markets mostly, the US and the Europe markets for the initial two decades when we are growing up. But uh, there has been a phenomenal change in the last decade, especially when it comes with the India market. So, uh, when we even look at the brands that are doing the game ads, uh, the last decade was more for social media, they have been following Instagram, Facebook. But this year the brands have come into gaming because they have realized the audience, especially the 25 to 44 year old, is where they'll actually find on gaming. And they're get, getting the best spots there. And there are different types of creative ads. Even at Ad Scholars, we do these kind of creative ads. We build mini games within the games. So, for example, a brand like a Nike or a Nestle can actually be built a game, a mini game, inside a game. So the audience can engage with these games and the brand as well. So it, it puts it in their mind. And uh, different features like in-gaming is something that we're doing. Yeah, within in-gaming what it comes is it's, it's not intrusive, just like how a pop-up comes or you're playing, it is inside the game. Uh, so, just like how the branding gets placed in the movies, it is getting placed. It's like a billboard that you see on a Western Expressway in Mumbai, it is actually like that. Um, even games like FIFA, Call of Duty, these are the games where players would love to see these kind of ads. So, that's an interesting space, right? Because at this point in time, that's the avenue for non-endemic brands to come into the picture and when they come in, that's when the uh, uh, revenues start going right. beyond the uh, core segment also, right? Yes. So, how, 
how are the non endemic brands looking at it at this point in time because some of them are using it for gamification so on and so forth but what's the trend there coming out so actually initially uh, a few years back it was only gaming industry related to gamers who used to advertise on gaming publishers but now fmcg is very interested um, automotive industry other sectors because they understand the audience are out here uh, they want to actually reach out to this audience and the best part with digital is the conversions that you can get right you can track each audience their data how they have reached their website and what has been done on that so especially when it comes with these kind of brands it's uh, it's there and we see for the next 2 years there will be triple the growth in the advertising industry when it comes with the gaming from like a 2.3 billion dollars to a 7 billion dollars so that's a huge growth and i'm still not talking much about metaverse and the other things which are taking the famous spots now for example in in outside uh, india uh, the concerts have been happening on metaverse uh, travis scott is there um, even uh, marshmallow has done a lot of concerts in india i've seen only dalar mehendi who initiated this but even with that one concert we have got audience of more than 20 million for that right so the growth is phenomenal even in metaverse for the brand placements interesting point because in the session not in the afternoon one of our colleagues is going to put up uh, something specific in terms of metaverse ar vr uh, so watch out for the session from uh, neeraj later on in the day uh, i'd like to bring in the e sports uh, uh, specialists and teams uh, into the picture in terms of revenue uh, anurag and monetization how do you see this space uh, uh are growing and what's the current trend what's the opportunities there so just before i answer that question nilesh uh, i have been to ism and gave a speech there trust me out of the class of i think 100 students 70% identified as a gamers there so i agree on his part uh coming to uh, your question uh, sada uh revenues are increasing like four years back only endemic brands were interested in sponsoring uh, there was nothing called media rights both categories exist today and even non endemic brands are getting involved like on weekly basis we are getting queries from brands hey we want to capture this audience we want to pass on this mess our message to this audience what is the best way and my answer to them is that guys we are a awareness funnel we are in the awareness funnel not in consideration or conversion funnel if you understand that then we can talk and 90% of the people actually agree with that okay we want this only so revenue streams are increasing uh i agree with that point because we've had multiple discussions in our organization on the same line. i know <laughs> yeah. you and us are both on the same page on that account so uh revenue streams are increasing apart from that uh even fantasy has been started on e-sports but unfortunately that company closed uh or shut down their e-sports uh, fantasy part that was the third stream but majority of the revenue will always be the sponsorship and second uh, biggest uh, revenue will be the media rights which both are happening now like we were done college league on uh, loco where it was only on loco so we sold them uh, the media rights for that event interesting from an RMG standpoint uh, uh, Jay I'd like to uh, hear your view in terms of monetization and revenue outside I mean uh, you've touched upon the fact that there is a lot of taxation issues and other things but how do you see that uh, panning out outside the current challenges which are facing there as an industry See uh, firstly I'll say a lot of new monetization uh, models are also coming up right everybody here even anurag spoke about you know how media rights will always be very important and i think advertisement and sponsorship will always lead the way when it comes to driving revenue for a particular platform right and of course from a rmg perspective um the direct revenue to us actually comes from the commissions or the rakes that we you know charge but apart from that i'll go back to my previous topic where i spoke about gaming right see anything which is engaging and innovatively coming up in a game right like at tfg i certainly cannot talk about what's going to be launched but we are coming up with gamification in this sector also which is linked to again monetization right so you develop newer uh, streams for revenue right and that includes probably in app purchases it can include you know uh, new gaming gear it can include um, 
you know, right from uh, uh, even merchandising, right? Uh, vouchers, coupons, all of that also. But like you rightly mentioned, there is a challenge, there is taxation. Even uh, uh, today, incentives or any referral bonuses that we give are taxed, right? As long as, of course, uh, they can be withdrawn. So if they cannot be withdrawn, they're not taxable, right? But my point of view out here is very simple, that there is a lot of innovation when it comes to revenue streams, and that is linked to product features. That's what I'm actually trying to get at. Uh, so in the morning session, I think Nitish interestingly mentioned one point, which is download to monetization ratio is not up to the mark uh, in our country right now, right? And Nina, any point of view on that particular data point? Sure. So if you look at India as a market, right, we are predominantly uh, a casual gaming market and, and that to the primary monetization is ad supported games. With, with, I would say 98% ad support, 2% in-app. Right, uh, and that two percent goes to RMG and PUBG. Yeah. So, uh, from, but but from that, yeah, BGMI. But from that perspective, what we also do as a publisher is we work with brands, and, and like Shrikant was mentioning, we do brand integration within the games. So, for the past two or three years now, we have been working with Hershey's for one of their brands, which is in one of our kid games. So, what we deliver to the brand is not just the CPM rates or the impressions; it's the engagement. Right? On an average, my game for a kid brand would deliver to them multi in multiples. I mean, uh, an average game session is five to seven minutes, three times a day. So that's 28, 21 to 28 minutes of engagement which we can get. And, and that sort of brand is massive. Now, it's a matter of how people, Shrikant and us can, and, and, and you can team up and go to the brand and show them that value. And that is what the monetization will drive. And obviously, eventually, yes, as games get better, engagement, people are spending on BGMI, which means that they are not averse to spending. People are spending on RMG, people are spending on Rummy games. Eventually, they will come and spend on a, on a Subway Surfer or a, uh, a Maya Nagri or those kind of games as well. So monetization is, is there. It just needs to be channeled in a proper manner. You know, I'd just like to add to that. So. Uh, predominantly, people have always gone to spend higher on a game because th there is cash rewards, right? If you give them right gaming experience, it's more engaging. Of course, the user base is willing to spend more and a perfect example is PUBG or BGMI, right? Because you get a certain engagement or a certain special power than, or you do an in-app purchase. So the idea is to give more engaging features again, you know? Absolutely. And, uh, <clears throat> From an esports perspective, sir, I mean, in terms of challenges you see uh, at this point in time, specifically to bring in a, a sponsorship or a revenue or a monetization in India uh, as against global titles or global teams, because see, at this point in time, we do not have the peripheral uh, sponsorships, uh, just like a merchandise deal, right? Those kind of the things are not yet open, have not yet opened up. And what are the reasons, and how do you see that progressing? Uh, as Anurag was saying, like uh, the broadcasting rights and uh, and the different kind of uh, like peripheral sponsor or the power by sponsor that we are talking about, so it's kind of opening up. We are getting the briefs. We are working closely with Group M and other agencies. Also, we are seeing uh, non-Indian brands are coming in. The, the challenge, I will not say this. It's a challenge. It's more about we they are saying ki what can be done and we have to show them ki what can be done in in terms of integration in terms of visibility and what they can get okay so it is as a as our job role also ki to convince them and, sh and show them the results also ki uh, what is the kind of roi they are they are getting uh, from there so i see the interest coming in and i i feel now yes the the budgets are not very high right now but in the coming years coming th down the line 3 4 years we will see the budgets are coming in cool so just a quick uh, pass, I mean, closing note from each one of you uh, uh, in terms of where do you see the potential and where do you see the future? A quick uh, uh, round of sure, sure. I'll, I'll, so. I'll start from Nilesh and then we'll move. So uh, for me, the closing note is very simple. Uh, 1.5 billion population, the consumer, the consumption is happening in India. The world is looking at India as the next, next big sporting destination. That creates multiple opportunities for us to stabilize, establish, and define the growth path. Thank you. Okay, uh, so what I would say is the biggest disruption that's going to happen in probably three years or four years from now is going to happen 
surprisingly in PC and console. The reason that I say that is today I know there are 25 productions happening in India, so the actual number might be closer to 50. And from these experiments, one of them are going to be a major hit. The kind of hit that I'm telling you is going to be something, let me give you an example. In a country called Estonia, there was a game called Disco Elysium. It's an indie game made by, on a very modest budget. That game had a net revenue of more than 80 million, which is 600 crores. So that's the kind of scope that I'm talking about. So from these PC console experiments that are happening, my game included, one or two of them are going to re reach that kind of a scale. When it does, the gaming industry in India is going to have a before and after moment. So 2026 is that time is what I'm th guessing. Yeah, I'll add it to it because I also see the PC and console market is coming back, especially with the other markets that we notice, how they are growing on the metaverse, AR and the VR. This is going to be the next future for the five years. And especially on the monetization part, uh, the mobile has been growing and the next decade is uh, opens up different revenue streams for all of us. Yep. In terms of the eSports and I see ki, uh, more cross-platform community when we'll see I think the more uh, IPs and in terms of esports games and publisher are coming to India and I, I see ki, uh, we should build more global IPs from here starting from India and then taking it to different regions. So to add to what Harish said, uh, while PC and console will grow, I think at mobile we haven't peaked yet and we're still growing and, and there's a lot more that we can achieve. We will see breakthrough IPs come out of India for the global market, uh, games which have been created, which could, yeah, the before-after moment is still even in mobile waiting to happen. And uh, hopefully the casual gaming and the mid-core gaming market will start making as much money as RMGs. See, I'd like to just say that online gaming is a sunrise sector for India, right? And I'd like to say that each one here is adding to that growth. Right, whether it's a game publisher, it's a casual game, or it's esports, everything adds to that. And I just say that online gaming as a whole is going to be, if not more, at least driving five to ten percent of the global revenue. India will do it. That's what I stand for. And it's not, you know, it's not going to be just RMG and mobile gaming. I've personally, passionately been a PC gamer also and a PS gamer also. So, uh, but. That sector is, of course, it's a, it's a different gameplay altogether. But I think together uh, in India as an online gaming sector, I think we should be able to drive uh, a significant amount of global revenues also. A uh, couple of points. Uh, Esports, we have not even touched the tip of the iceberg. So there's a long way to go. <clears throat> On the console side, I have a very different opinion uh, there that uh, console base is so small. Yes, there might be a title which might do become a hit internationally, but consumption in India for the title won't be that big because the title, the boxes are small. That's why. PC, yes, it is growing very fast. Uh, but why I still believe, though I was a non-believer of mobile esports to be very precise, but mobile is a personal device, whereas PC is still a family device. A person might have one PC at home which is shared by the parent and the kid, but mobile is very personal, so mobile will grow. And I agree with Ninad also, uh, though not to the extent that we have not reached the pinnacle. Yes, we might have not reach the pinnacle of gaming on mobile as the user base, because one thing which COVID brought in was number of gamers. My wife who never, who hated me for me spending so much time playing games, she became a gamer. Of course, she played Ludo, more casual game, but that number is increasing day by day now. So, one, one little thing I'll add, uh, one small little detail about, uh, in, uh, on top of what Anurag was telling. So, 2022 saw a resurgence of something that we would call handheld gaming devices. So, I'm talking about device like Steam Deck and Asus ROG Ally and PlayStation is also now coming up with another handheld. So, the biggest problem on PC and console was always that it was a home device, right? It's not flexible, it's committal. So that has been broken away in the biggest way in 2022. After the massive success of Steam Deck, every PC manufacturer is jumping onto create a device category that is on your hand, can be taken everywhere. In fact, Microsoft is so bullish on that device category that they are now creating a version of Windows that is compatible for controller-based handheld devices. 
So that kind of overcomes all of those problems we were talking where it is only in the home, where you can't game it everywhere. So that kind of disruption is happening on the PC console space, which means it also has an implication on monetization because there is more engagement now. So PC console is getting there, where only mobile phones were there, PC and console is also getting into that flexible kind of an environment. So by uh, last point, uh, Arish, my issue is not with the device per se, but if my kid asks for a phone, it's a multi-purpose device for him. On he, the basic purpose for him to is to talk, but he doesn't use for talking. He uses for video. My son is 10, by the way, for video, YouTube, and to play games. Okay, he's okay if you take out, take the same out. He's perfectly okay with that. So the device is multi-purpose. So people, parents, at least tend to give it to them that they can be connected, which is not true for mobile. Uh, handled consoles. Secondly, yeah, Microsoft came up with Zoom. You know what happened. Sony came up with the PSP. You know what happened. So, yes, there might be some hits. Apple came up with the iPods and see where it is. Apple came with iPhone with most expensive device today and doing good numbers. So, I am not saying this is how it is, but this is how traditional it has been. Yeah. There's a lot of… Uh, great to see so much passion. Uh, a heated uh, uh, discussion in terms of uh, the industry in itself. Uh, but <clears throat> I'd say there's a lot of optimism, uh, there's a lot of passion. I think we see a lot of passion in the ecosystem in itself. All I'd say is upwards and onwards and in the near future, uh, hoping to see franchises as big as IPL, hoping to see titles bigger than uh, the movie titles and uh, and it's 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 on the upward upward trajectory thank you thank you everyone thanks a lot